Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, a lady I have interviewed before. Um, her name is Victoria Milligan, who I can honestly say is a true inspiration. If we ever become uncertain of how to make change and overcome difficulties, you only need to think of this woman. Please welcome Victoria Milligan to the stage. Hello, everybody. Um, wow, it's been the most incredible day, I feel. If someone said, you know, how do you feel in that mindfulness way, I would say inspired, excited to be part of this incredible um, team and people that are engaged already sort of about mental health and really thinking about what it is about everything that I've learned today that I as an individual can take back into my workplace and just think about making kind of small changes. Um, doesn't, not everything has to be enormous, but maybe talking to that person that I might have been slightly concerned about before, but actually making a real effort, because um, I think it is those small changes that make such a huge difference. So I wanted to leave you today with a story um, that I'm sure a lot of you know, but it is, it is a very sad story, but it is also one of hope and inspiration and resilience. And I want to tell you a bit about what's happened to me and also um, what makes me feel very strongly about strong mental health, what has helped me over the last five years, um, and share with you, I suppose, some of my strategies and tools of coping um, in, and hope that it helps you or helps you to help other people um, that might be struggling as well. So back in um, 2013, in May, I was involved in a pretty horrendous boat accident, speedboat accident, with my husband and my four children, and our boat went out of control, and six of us were thrown out of the water in the very cold Camel estuary in Cornwall. Um, the boat, unfortunately, had been on full lock and full turn, and the kill cord wasn't attached, so the first thing I saw when I surfaced in the water was the boat going round at high speed, full turns, coming back at us again and again in the water and hitting us. And without going into too much detail, um, my husband was killed, and my eight-year-old daughter was killed. I lost my left leg, and I was holding my son, Kit, at the time, who was four, who had been shouting, no more cold water, mummy, no more cold water. And I sort of grabbed him and thought that we could swim to the nearest beach to get away from the boat, but as it turned out, I like to think I swam enough away from the boat to save both our lives, but as I turned around to see where it was, um, I felt the hull of the boat hit me in the chest, but I didn't feel it um, cut my leg. I thought he'd lost his leg because his little trainer was floating on the surface of the water. Um, but after 12 months of operations and wearing a massive, enormous metal fixator where he had to kind of just go round and round like that, um, his leg is saved, which is amazing. So he is a little miracle and now runs around um, like any other normal 10-year-old, which is fantastic. So I know a lot about how life can change in a split second, in an instant, and the trajectory you thought your life was going on suddenly takes a massive, sharp left turn to somewhere completely different. The whole rug was pulled away from me, and the future that I thought I was going to have with the people that I thought I was going to have in it. You know, you get married, you have your children, you think they're going to be part of your life forever and ever and ever. You plan what you're going to do for their 18th, 21st, what we're going to do when we retire. That was gone straight away. I was 41 years old, and I'd suddenly inherited all these new titles that I couldn't even really relate to, kind of widow. I mean, widows are old and wear black, and I didn't really feel like a widow. I'd woken up that morning having begged the surgeon to try and save my leg, because I knew that I was a single parent now, but woke up without my left leg there. Amputee, disabled person, bereaved parent, single, no sole parent, as my divorce friends keep telling me, because I don't have anyone to pass them on to every other weekend, unfortunately. Um, and I suddenly thought, well, this is absurd. You know, any one of those losses would surely be too much for me to cope with, but all three of them is impossible. There's absolutely no way. I can't, I can't, I can't. I said that a lot at the beginning. I just can't do it. I'm terrified, I'm scared, I'm fear of failure, fear of the pain of grief, the pain of loss, the pain of longing. Everything was just terrifying. And time just sort of came, took this whole new meaning on, which it was irrelevant. I couldn't believe the clocks were still going, that, you know, Nick and Emily weren't here anymore. How was time still carrying on? But, you know, it does. That's the thing. It doesn't stop. And you have to find a way to cope with whatever challenge it is that you're going through. And hopefully none of you will go through something similar to what I've been going through. But 
anything is relative to your own circumstance and we have to try and find skills and tools and strategies for us to be able to cope and for me the only thing I could do was literally try and get up have a shower and just take it one step at a time which reminds me why are there so many metaphors about feet when you only have one you suddenly realize and the doctors would keep saying just come over here and put your feet up I mean foot sorry what you need to do is just keep putting one foot in front of the other well that's more of a hop really for you but you get my meaning, um, so that slightly made me giggle a bit when <laughs> nothing else really did. So it was literally, right, I'm just going to, I've got to save Kit's leg. Let's just try and save Kit's leg, and then I just imagined literally kind of melting into a, a grief puddle in the floor, like the kind of Wicked Witch of the West or East, or whichever it was in Wizard of Oz. Um, I thought, I'll just do that, and then they don't really need me anymore because then they're, they're all fine physically, and I can just sort of take myself off and disappear. And I often wonder why I didn't melt into a grief puddle. And I think it really was making a decision. I sort of decided, I read book after book after book. We're so used to, in the workplace, having training and strategies, and there must be a manual for grief. There must be a manual for losing your husband and eight-year-old daughter and leg. And no, funnily enough, there wasn't anything like that on Amazon in the search department. What I did find was, sad story after sad story after sad story about other people that experienced horrendous loss and and I just thought I can't read any more sad stories I've got my sad you know I've got a really sad story and the grief books are amazing but they're quite sort of clinical you know you'll go through the five stages and you'll have anger and acceptance and blah 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 but they're not linear you don't just kind of go through them and tick them off and go right anger done acceptance done you they come back at you at all sorts of times you feel sometimes like you're swimming to use a ridiculous metaphor but you're at the bottom of the sea just being tumbled and tumbled and you don't know which way is up and somehow you've got to find which way is up and lots of things help me find which way is up but very very slowly there was one story that really resonated with me I found um, this girl had written the story about, and she's probably about my age, she's probably mid-40s, and she said when she was 10, her brother jumped off a bridge that was into too shallow water, and he died, he killed himself, he broke his neck, um, and she said not only did I lose my brother that day, but I also lost my mum, because she couldn't cope, and she took herself off to a room, and you know, doesn't, history doesn't relate what happened to her, but she obviously had a breakdown, and just couldn't cope, and I just remember then and there thinking, in St Mary's Paddington, no leg, my three children, that is not going to happen to them. I just felt this surge of whatever it was, kind of maternal instinct or human survival instinct that was incredibly powerful, that whatever happens, it's not fair what's happened to them. They haven't asked for this. None of us have asked for this. It was a horrendous accident that a perfect storm of events has led to this awful thing. And however much you analyse how it happened, why it happened, whose fault it was, it has happened. And a lot of these challenges and mental health issues that a lot of us go through is accepting where we are. And it took me a long time to accept where I was, that Nico and Emily aren't going to come back. However much I try and have that dream of not standing up and, and not trying to make another turn and, and, and not doing that and screaming at myself to sit back down in the boat, they're not coming back and I have to cope. And I was jealous of Nico at the beginning. I'll admit it now. I was jealous that he didn't have to cope with any of this pain, um, any of this hideous horror and the questions that the children kept asking me and things that they'd seen it was all just very very dark but I think all of us get to the stage where you accept you don't try and analyze too much you can't do anything about the past and you have to make that decision that you are going to cope and you're going to move forward and then we can start to find the tools and the strategies that can help us cope and move forward so very much for me it was that one step at a time very small achievable goals of let's make sure that Kit's leg is saved Let's just make it to Amber Sports Day. Let's just try and go to Olivia's concert. Um, and then I'll slowly but surely you're doing it. And you can't quite believe that you're doing it, but you're starting to live again. Because at the beginning, obviously, my diary was empty. Like, can you imagine? I mean, probably a lot of you wish that your diary was a lot less full, but my diary was completely black. I had nothing in it. And then slowly but surely it would fill with hospital appointments, prosthetic leg appointments, physio for me, kit, wheelchairs, everything, all those things that you can't quite believe that you're in the limb fitting centre with fake legs everywhere. I mean, it just didn't really feel real. 
Um, but this was my new way of life. And I learned a lot from Kit because three weeks after the accident, it was his fifth birthday. And bizarrely, it was in St. Mary's Paddington, just when lovely William was um, having his first baby with Kate. And the sort of dichotomy of emotions of, you know, remembering what it was like to have your firstborn child and the love and happiness and amazing emotions that go with that. And then we just had our complete life ripped apart. And every time we walked out of the Lindo Wing, there was celebrations and flags and Union Jacks and obviously incredibly happy, but the, the, the kind of opposite emotions that we were going through just made it feel very, very raw. But he still says that it was one of the happiest birthdays of his life because he was, children are very mindful. You know, they live in the present, they live in the now. They don't angst, they don't worry. Okay, they don't have the, mature, the mental maturity to worry too much about the future, but they very much live in the now. And what is happening now? I'm getting toys, presents, sweets. There's someone dressed as a lion. I've got balloons. I've got all this kind of stuff. And he had an amazing day, and he still talks about it as being one of the best days of his life. Of course, I was crying my eyes out because Nico should have been there, seeing him turn five. And, but it is absolutely amazing. And... The emotion of his friends pushing him in his wheelchair on sports day down uh, the running race. Um, obviously, I am literally an absolute weeping mess. He's going, first time I've ever won the race. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> loved it. Um, joy of joys, rosette, you know, literally kind of lifted. Second year he does it, everyone's crying because he actually runs it with his leg. His leg has been saved. He doesn't win, it's not a Hollywood movie, but um, <laughs> he just remembers it as actually being quite a joyous time. You know, I got spoiled, everyone gave me presents, what's not to like? And that was a real lesson for me, because actually when you are broken physically and emotionally, and you're pretty much at a base human level, you know, I couldn't walk, I was totally reliant on everybody to do anything for me, which is a real giving up of control, which I know a lot of us find very hard. I found it very hard. Not being able to just go make a cup of tea when you want to make a cup of tea, anything is very difficult. But part of it was, I'm actually sitting in my garden and looking at how beautiful it is. I actually smell the roses in my garden. You know, you have to stop. You have no choice because you can't run around like a manic person like we all normally do. So it slowed me down and that is one of the lessons that I've tried to take with me going forward. Just appreciate the here and now, slow down, be patient, don't be in a rush to make things happen, everything takes time, put the time and effort in and the rewards are enormous. You know, learning to walk on a um, prosthetic leg, I thought it'd be really easy. Paralympians have got a lot to answer for, let me tell you. Uh, it's not that easy, it really hurts and you've got wounds, scars on the bottom of your leg and I sit down, I'd walk from here to the monitor, I'd sit down, I'd fling it off, I'd go, I'm never going to do this, because I spent my whole life in a wheelchair. But then you put it back on, and eventually you're walking, hopefully without a limp, you think, well, that was okay, I've done that, maybe I'll try a 10K. So slowly but surely, you kind of have these goals, and the sense of power and achievement and invincibility that it gave me, that I thought, my God, if I can do that, then... Maybe I can choose what songs to have at their funeral, which have just been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Maybe I can start to read some of the letters that people have sent me. Maybe, and that feeling of achievement, I think, transgresses into all areas of our life. Um, it was a really important factor for me, and I still think about it a lot. You know, don't try and set yourself ridiculous goals, but just, you know, almost like the next day, the next week, the next month, uh, just try and get through that and we will all be good. And, and with grief, you know, grief was just, I was so scared of it. I just kept looking for that little door to get through to the other side. There must be something where I can just come through to the other side. All will be fine again. Won't be crying every time I go to Waitrose and see a jar of peanut butter, which is Emily's favourite, or some chicken Kiev, which is Nico's. You know, there's grief triggers wherever you go. And... What I learned was that there's no little door and every journey is entirely personal. You know, we've heard a lot about that today. Any mental health challenge or whether it's grief or um, finances or health or whatever it is, it's incredibly personal. You take your time to go through it, however quickly or slowly you want to do it. But it's about finding the right help at the right time and working out the right support for you. And I, I thought a lot about, you know, who are... Who are the right travelling partners for me in life? You know, I did have an amazing grief counsellor who actually was William's grief counsellor as well, Julia, Julia Samuels from um, Child Bereavement UK is totally incredible. 
And that was amazing, but it's also having your, what does someone call it before, social architecture, social structure, that you have these amazing people in your life that you go to for different things. And we have so many amazing people in our life, whether it's our parents, our kids, our friends, our uncles, whatever. But they're all friends for a different reason. That's what I worked out. So I had my super organized friend Edwina, who would do like a schedule for people coming to visit, and they'd have like 16 and a half minutes each, and then she'd shoot them out the door because she's going to get too tired, and a little schedule of no more lasagna or brownies, but if you could bring a quinoa and courgette salad, that'd be great, and you know, some sushi. So she was amazing, because of course that's what you just cannot think about. The other thing to remember when you're going through mental challenges is that you are exhausted. It is so tiring to try and just get out of bed and have a shower and have breakfast. You can't possibly think about what you're going to have for lunch or doing your tax return or we have to be super compassionate to ourselves and kind to ourselves and my, one of my other best friends Vicky is a yoga teacher so she's the arm and amazing and she'd come around and make me breathe a lot which I just thought was normal but apparently there's like a technique to breathe so she'd teach me to breathe properly um, and she would say talk to yourself as though you're talking to me talk to yourself as though you're talking to your best friend would you say to me you are rubbish you, all you've done today is like 11.30 you've got up you look rubbish you've got like tracksuit bottoms on and your hair is really greasy you haven't even had breakfast yet, it's an absolute disgrace. No, you would say, oh my God, you are amazing. You're not upstairs drowning in the bottle of vodka. You have got up, you've got your kids dressed, you've got them to school, you've managed to do some maths with Kit. You've managed to tell your teenage daughter that she's not going out tonight, huge achievement. And actually, it's being compassionate to yourself and being kind. And that's a real lesson for me that I've learned kind of going forward is, just be a bit nicer. Don't just give yourself a really hard time all the time and just say, well, you could have done that. We could have done that a lot better, but actually you just handed it in. It was a bit average. Sometimes average is okay. You know, finished is better than not done. That's what I've worked out over being very busy. So I had super organized Edwina, Vicky. I had um, someone with a really big car uh, that had, could fit both wheelchairs in, uh, but she's a really nice person as well. But looking for those... <laughs> <laughs> wasn't just because she had a nice car. Looking for those people that can help you and support you. And, you know, I remember my grief counsellor saying, so many people wanted to see me. You know, you sort of, it's awful, but you have a sort of fame when you've been through a, dr a dreadful tragedy. And people kind of want to be a bit part of it and know what's going on all the time. And you feel like just doing a bit of a podcast weekly, kind of saying, well, kid's leg's still not saved. I'm still not walking. I still look awful. Um, and, you know... It was three things. Do you look forward to seeing them? Or is it a bit of a chore? And you're at university with them and you've counselled them about five times, but they're still kind of in your life. Do they make you feel good when you're with them? And do you feel good after you're with them? And I thought that was a really amazing tool. You know, kind of those three things. It's very simple, really simple. So I now have three friends, which is great. <laughs> Everyone else completely gone out of my life. So... Um, and I think that is it. It's luckily I am a talker. And I know we've talked a lot today about being brave, um, opening up, you know, talking about your emotions. It is so important. You know, sharing is one of the biggest things that we can do to the right people is so incredibly powerful. And we all know how we feel. And we've been feeling awful all day. And we go out and have a really good banter um, with a girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever and we feel fantastic the next day and that for me I think has been a real saviour just being able to emote and, and open up and and also being in control of the conversation because people try and find out what's happening all the time and after a while I thought you know, I'm so bored of talking about something desperately sad all the time tell me what's going on in your life tell me what's happening with you because half the problem when you've been through something very dramatic is that you forget the day-to-day issues and challenges of what's going on in everybody else's life and I felt a bit out of touch with everybody. Um, obviously I'll bring the conversation back to me pretty swiftly but once I'd found out what was um, going on with them. But it's really, it's, you feel that you know I'm not being a friend because I'm, all I'm doing is taking but being a friend is giving as much as you are taking and that was kind of really important to me as well. So patience, small steps, um, taking your time doing things, 
reaching out for, for support, being brave um, and emoting, I think for me, were really important. And, you know, a big one that we've talked about as well is, is, is self-love and self-care and really, really looking after yourself. And I know it's dull and it's the last thing you feel like doing, but eating well, exercising for me was a massive thing and having been to the addiction talk, and I'm slightly worried that I might be a little bit addicted to it. Um, but it's... She said it was all right if you weren't trying to um, suppress your emotions. So if you're crying when you're running, is that suppressing your emotions? I'm not sure. But anyway, it made me feel better, so I did it a lot and got a fantastic blade and did a few triathlons and also wanted to raise a lot of money. You know, this awful, horrendous thing had happened to my family. But we had been rescued by the most incredible people. The rescue services, until you've been in that awful situation... We know they're there, we know the air ambulance is there and the ambulances are there and the paramedics and amazing people that work in hospitals. But until you've been in that situation, you don't realise how a minute could be the difference between life and death. And, you know, they rescued us from the most horrific scene I'm sure they've ever seen in their, their working lives. They're volunteers, the RNLI people are volunteers. RAF took us to um, Derriford Trauma Hospital. Cornwall Air Ambulance was on standby. So we organised, you know, a huge kind of night to remember my husband... We organised a massive bike ride um, from Cornwall to London. A lot of friends didn't speak to me after that, which I think is why I've actually only got three. But we're doing another one, if anybody would like to <laughs> take part. It's going to be just in Cornwall, so really hilly. Um, but it was really important for me to, to, to give back and leave a lasting legacy for them. So the Cornish Air Ambulance actually has a plaque on the front that says, Nico and Emily flying around Cornwall saving lives together which always slightly makes me cry when I say it because I love the fact that they are doing good. They're going out saving people. And I've got friends that are down there that will just text me and go, just see Nico and Emily flying around rescuing you know, some more people, which is really incredible. And my kids have all been involved in that as well. And I think one thing that it has done is, is really bonded us together. Having thought, I can't do this and I don't want to do this. But then having decided that, do you know what, I've actually got no choice. And people say, you're so brave. I go, well, I'm not actually, because I'm a mum and I'm all they've got. And, and I don't want to be a sort of crap mum with one leg that can't walk and a bit disabled. And don't get me wrong, the blue badge is really handy. And um, <laughs> speedy boarding is quite good as well. And they always laugh at me when I start limping really badly as we're going up to the airport, but don't tell anybody that. Um, so that is good. But I just fought against that whole kind of disability thing because I wanted them to think that they had this strong, you know, powerful parent. And sometimes I think I've gone slightly overboard because Kit was talking to Olivia when the Olympics were on and Usain Bolt was about to run and Kit goes... I bet mum could beat him. <laughs> Thanks, Kit. Literally about half his size, but anyway. Um, so that bonding together, I think, has been absolutely amazing. And now we are this incredible team. And even though, tragically, they've had their whole childhood blanket of naivety cruelly whipped, ripped away from them, and they know that awful things can happen, they also know that when awful things happen, the support is there. There are things we can do about it. And we can all learn to be resilient. You know, we're not born resilient. It's like we can learn the strategies. And it's a constant. You know, I'm not going to stand up here and go, I am resilient. I've had times when I feel pretty good and quite strong and quite resilient. I have times when I feel absolutely awful and I've had a dream about Emily or I've sat in Nico's armchair in the house and I just, I want to go back to before it all happened. But... I know now that I can cope. I know the path for me is lows, but I'm always going to come out of it. And the human survival instinct is incredible. And if I can give anyone any hope, whatever challenge we're going through, we've all got the power to survive it. It might not seem it at times, and there's some incredibly dark times, I can tell you, but we're all strong enough to be able to cope with whatever is thrown at us. And we can all personally inspire other people and help other people. We've all been through stuff. You know, no one gets to grand old age of <coughs> 47 um, without going through something awful. And whatever we've learned from what we've been through, help others and share your story. And, you know, it is, the power of storytelling is incredible. And it makes you feel close to people. It makes other people want to share their stories. And it means that we feel that we've massively helped other people. And there's nothing more rewarding to think that we've help someone else in their dark times. So I just want to leave you with those thoughts and my top tips for resilience and getting through horrendous things. 
Um, actually, my other one, which I forgot to say, is I've learnt to appreciate the small, frequent hooks of joy in my life, rather than the intensity of joy. So it used to be the big holiday, or the skiing, or the week in Portugal, and you know, sometimes that just feels too far away when you are feeling quite vulnerable and low. I can't wait till the next July. I need to know that I've got a coffee with a girlfriend on Saturday, or I've got my favourite lunch on Thursday, or you know, go to cinema and whatever. So it's just, for me, it's a real tool to just put things in, quite frequent things in. They don't have to be huge things, they don't have to be expensive things, it can just be a dog walk with a friend, but just to know that I've got something to look forward to and that social interaction with people that I love and they love me is, is hugely important to me. So, I just want to say thank you so much again to um, This Can Happen for organising today and for having me on to speak. And let's all, I know that I'll be going back tomorrow and being a champion of change um, for my organisation. And it is, it's those small things that we can do. And let's go back and try and inspire others to um, have a strong, it's well-being. You know, I, I, I don't like the term mental health. I love the term, it's, it's, it's all encompassing. It's physical, it's mental, it's just us being on top of our game. That's what we need to do and that's what we need to inspire others to do. So thank you very much. Well, that says it all, Victoria. Amazing. What can we say? Um, to bring our conference to an end this way with your totally inspirational story has been a genuine honour for us. We can only hope to be the champion of change that you have been. So thank you thank again. You. Really, thank you. So we have reached the end of the day and we would like to thank you all so much for coming today. We feel from what we have seen and heard that we have created something special. People have even revealed their previously private obstacles and challenges to their colleagues today in the breaks because of what they've heard and seen today. <clears throat> Yeah, I've heard of a couple of instances today where people have made some disclosures, one or two, and I think that um, what I'm confident of is that when those disclosures are, are heard, that if they go back to their places of work and the answer isn't there, that at least that company is on the right journey to helping that person. I think that's what it is. It's the intention and the intent uh, more than anything. That was amazing, um, Victoria, and I'm not gonna try and do it justice by giving a comment, so I'm just gonna let that hang, amazing. <laughs> so I guess a final thought for me, sort of like Jerry Springer, we'll see. Um, so firstly, this incredible day has surpassed all of our expectations. When Johnny, Zoe, and I started talking about putting together a game-changing conference, we only dared imagined that the reality would be like this. A large hotel full of over 750 excited, willing and enthusiastic delegates representing businesses across the UK and being taught and inspired by such knowledgeable speakers. But I, I just feel like I'm telling you stuff you already know anyway. So uh, a few things have stood out for me today. I made some notes backstage. One, just the palpable excitement um, in, in all of the rooms today when I was having conversations and listening to conversations. Second, the atmosphere and openness and willingness and a desire to make change. And um, thirdly, I think no matter how many times you, you meet or speak to Prince William, you always feel like a giggling schoolgirl. <laughs> Just me, or... <laughs> So finally, guys, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, this morning, I said more than once that this can happen. And, and I think today, 
I hope, has shown us that this is happening. Thank, thanks to you. Thank you.